Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with the summer 2023 version of our Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Uh, before I answer any questions, I want to remind you that my responses are just guesses. There's no way that I could get a full medical history or even a list of all the medications that uh, a questioner is asking. Uh, so I have to make guesses. The guesses may be wrong, but the purpose of the response is to teach you a little more about diabetes and a little more about the physiology treatment and so on. Um, before we get to the questions, there were a couple of articles in the scientific journals that are of interest, I should mention. Uh, the journal Diabetes Care in June discovers all of a sudden that there are musculoskeletal complications of diabetes, something that I've been pointing out in the videos ever since the videos began, and which I uh, published as a chapter in someone else's book about 20 years ago, and which I discovered in my patients about 40 years ago, namely that these musculoskeletal complications are quite common, almost universal. It's almost as if every long-standing uh, diabetic has one or more of these complications, namely frozen shoulder, carpal tunnel syndrome, trigger finger, Dupuytren's contractures, uh, and all of a sudden the ADA is now discovering that these things exist. Um, there's been a report from China of a substance that supposedly cures type 2 diabetes permanently. And uh, as one might suspect, there are serious questions about this. Um, although it was published in a Chinese peer-reviewed journals, I don't know how those compared to uh, the English language peer-reviewed journals in terms of veracity. Um, this supposed universal cure for type 2 diabetes, if it's ca caught early, uh, when you look at the numbers, it applies only to 63% of the people who they tried it on. On top of that, they call a cure a cure based on the guidelines of the American Diabetes Association, namely uh, blood uh, hemoglobin A1C of under 7.0, which is an average blood sugar of something like 180 milligrams per deciliter, which is more than double normal. So if your blood sugar is double normal, they consider it a cure. So again, this is a typical of cures that we hear from all over the world that have been going on for years. Back to the questions now. Is there such a thing as weight loss resistance? I am 68 years old and go between 193 and 198 pounds without bulging. I've been eating low carbohydrate for years. How can I lose weight? Well, first of all, he says low carbohydrate, but he might be eating lots of other things uh, such as fats, and uh, although a, a big factor in a weight loss diet is cutting out the excess carbohydrate, if you're eating tons of calories, uh, you're still going to gain weight. Um, so we, we don't know what he's doing. Let's say that he's also on a very low carb, low calorie diet, then there's a possibility that this well publicized uh, new medication, Monjaro, M-O-U-N-J-A-R-O, that I've spoken about in the past, 
may be of value. Um, you have to discuss this with your physician. There are potential side effects of Manjaro, but it does significantly reduce overeating. And in my experience with my patients, uh, has enabled them to achieve considerable weight loss. I know that you've indicated possible increase in cancer risk with Lantus insulin. Do you have any thoughts on other insulin causing cancer? Well, the Lantus story was not my thoughts. It was studies uh, in Europe based upon uh, national records where there's National Health Service and they, uh, where they kept statistics on various diseases that uh, patients had and they found that people who uh, were taking Lantus insulin had higher inc inc incidences of certain cancers. So it's not a matter of my thinking and uh, all I know is what studies are readily available to anyone who wants to look at the literature. Why does my Lantus not last a full night at times? One night I'll stay 75 all night, the next I'll awaken with a high again uh, at 4 a high alarm at 4.30 with a blood sugar of 288. I ate the same low-carb meal both nights. Any ideas? Well, the first, if the meal was really the same two nights in a row, there's always the possibility of gastroparesis, and I've mentioned this over and over in the past. Gastroparesis probably affects almost everyone who's had high blood sugars for five years or more. And if it's 10 years, you can be certain. And what typically happens with gastroparesis is you're low after a meal because uh, your digestion is too slow. And then maybe three, eight, or 10 hours later, your blood sugar goes sky high and you never know how many hours later and uh, you never know how high it's going to be because the stomach now has emptied finally hours after you had the meal. I've been type 2 diabetic for about five years. My A1C last month was 9.0, which is pretty darn high. I would say it's an average blood sugar of um, around 260. Problem is, I think I may have developed gastroparesis. I did the emptying study and it came back normal. Now what he's talking about is the gastric emptying study, which is recommended by the American Diabetes Association even though uh, typically with gastroparesis, it'll come back normal three out of four times. And of course, uh, insurance is not going to pay for you to do four studies. Um, so they only do one study and the likelihood is that it'll come back normal. The hallmark of gastroparesis is its unpredictability. So yeah, and a gastric emptying study is just to um, consume a meal that's uh, been treated with a radioactive substance, usually technetium, and then they take a gamma ray image of your uh, abdomen over the next three, four hours and watch the radioactive food go down in your stomach on these images. And since the um, emptying is unpredictable, the results of the study are going to be unpredictable. 
And if the radiographer is very lucky, he may catch you on a day when you have very slow emptying and he'll just say you have gastroparesis. So uh, I've been using the RR interval study, which is a test for autonomic neuropathy. And I have an article uh, published in the journal Diabetes Care many years ago on how to uh, do this test. And he says, I don't know of any doctors in my area who can perform an RR study. Is there anything else I can do? Uh, that is to make the diagnosis. And what I usually do is tell people to procure a substance that will enhance gastric emptying. And the one that we usually use is called motilium. And it's uh, not available in the USA because the company who makes motilium also makes the substance sold in the USA, Reglan, and um, they're not going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars for FDA testing of motilium when they're already selling Reglan. The trouble with Reglan is that the adverse effects profile is horrendous. It includes depression, somnolence, um, uh, neurologic symptoms, uh, some of which don't resolve when you stop the drug. And I've seen these horrendous symptoms and I refuse to use Reglan on my patients uh, anymore. So we import motilium from Canada and we've had no trouble with it. So you could procure motilium and um, see if it improves your blood sugar profile after meals. And that's how we can make uh, an inferred diagnosis of gastroparesis. I'm a 44-year-old male and have borderline type 2 diabetes. I've been trying to follow your low-carbohydrate diet, and it is definitely working for me from a blood sugar point of view. I'm a computer analyst, and I often have intense periods of brain activity. During these periods, often during meetings, I find it difficult sometimes to think properly, as though my brain is short of substance. Have you heard any such accounts from any of your patients? Well, I can think of two things. One thing is hypothyroidism. Um, if you have very low thyroid, you could have a dementia, which I had when I was in college. We didn't know I was hypothyroid, and I could not remember things. And uh, I was getting a B minus average. And when I started engineering school, I was still way down there. And then a doctor suspected hypothyroidism, did a test on me, found out I was had a severely low metabolism, put me on a thyroid replacement, and lo and behold, I went from B minus to an A plus average and got all kinds of awards. Uh, so it can make a big difference. And hypothyroidism is very common amongst diabetics. Autoimmune diseases tend to come in clusters, and that's hypothyroidism is one of the other autoimmune disorders. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is low blood sugars. With early type 2 diabetes, one of the defects is not just elevated blood sugars, but inability of the beta cells that secrete insulin to function in a manner that jibes with the actual blood sugar. So your blood sugar may be high and it may not be, the pancreas may not be making enough insulin 
or it may be low and the pancreas may be making too much insulin at that point in time. So you might have a low blood sugar. So one thing you could do is check your blood sugar when you're having brain fog and seeing if it's running too low. Uh, that's all I could think of. There may be other problems uh, such as iron deficiency, anemia, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, and so on. Do you think it is possible for someone to arrive at an old age, let's say 95 years old, and have the cognitive ability to take measurements, inject insulin by themselves? Do you know of any other, anyone other than yourself? <laughs> or can you share a story of someone very old who does that to give his... Um, Give us, give us some inspiration. Well, I'm not 95, I'm only 89. And um, I have treated people around my age. And as I recall, they usually, they're able to give themselves insulin, but they have problems in following directions. And um, they usually are people who have had diabetes uh, for, let's say, the past 10 years and have had high blood sugars for 10 years. So I can't put them in a category equivalent to, to mine. So uh, I can't help you. Um, uh, if you look at the annual Jocelyn Award dinners, you'll come upon some elderly people who are still alive with type 1 diabetes, and um, they usually describe themselves as having been on low carbohydrate diets and on taking multiple insulin doses. So that may be a source of such people. Why should we use insulin to treat diabetes if diabetes is a, is a consequence of high insulin level in the body? Should I continue treatment with insulin or try every everything possible to avoid adding more insulin if I already have too much insulin? Well, I don't know where this person got this kind of nonsense that it's... Uh, high insulin that causes diabetes. Yes, it's true that uh, diabetes is much more common in obese people, and obese people may have relatively high serum insulin levels because of the insulin resistance brought on by their obesity. But that doesn't mean that insulin caused the diabetes. So um, I think that you ought to probably ought to read my book. It'll tell you a little more about uh, the physiology of diabetes. Speaking of my book, unfortunately, your book, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes so Solution, The Complete Guide to Achieving Normal, Achieving Normal Blood Sugars, is not available in German. Do you have any plans to translate it into German. Well, it's not my plans. That's not what decides where it's going to be published. It's where there's a demand for it. And if you're in Germany and want to get it published in German, you have to find uh, a German publisher and you have to find a translator who would translate it into German. Now, you could contact the publisher of my book, and the publisher's name is already printed on the English version of the book. Um, and uh, they might want to contact their German contact, their German publisher. But uh, if the German publisher feels there's no demand, 
he's not going to publish, and he's certainly not going to publish if there's no one to translate it. So we actually need someone who uh, speaks German, probably a physician, who's willing to translate, and in all likelihood the German publisher is not going to pay him to translate it, but might give him a small royalty uh, if he does translate it and he sells and sells and copies are sold. By the way, there are um, copies, I believe, in Swedish, in um, Polish, and in Japanese. We have a lot of non-questions, just st statements of gratitude for the book. Can you tell me what are some of the current over-the-counter appetite suppressants you use for carbohydrate pr craving? Well, I guess the most popular one would be water or any non-caloric drink. Um, if you drink several glasses of water before a meal, you might be less likely to uh, overeat at that meal. Not guaranteed, though. Uh, I don't know of any over-the-counter appetite suppressants. Uh, there are plenty of uh, phony claims. If you look on the Internet, um, you could do a search for over-the-counter appetite suppressants, and you'll finally probably find many, and in all likelihood, none of them will be effective. Um, I did mention a prescription medication, Monjaro, and that has been very effective with my patients, um, but it has to be prescribed carefully by a doctor who's familiar with the potential complications that might that it might bring. Uh, I usually do a number of blood tests every few months when people are taking Monjaro. Is there such a thing as C-peptide injections along with insulin? Uh, there have been a number of reports that C-peptide, which is uh, a precursor of insulin, uh, performs a number of functions in the body that insulin does not perform. So there may well be some value to C-peptide injections. However, C-peptide, which may be available from some custom chemical houses, is very costly, uh, may be available in very tiny amounts at very great expense, and it's not available for injecting into humans. So it might be a good idea, but you can't get it. If I follow a low-carbo eating plan, I need to correct hypoglycemia. Do I correct the glucose I am using? Do, no, do I... Correct, yeah, do I correct the glucose I am using when I am correcting my uh, uh, carbohydrates. I think that's up to you. Um, you shouldn't have to be taking a lot of glucose in the course of a day, but um, I may, I every day may be taking a few grams of glucose uh, to raise my blood sugar if I'm getting too close to uh, my target warning on my continuous glucose monitor. Um, my warning is at a blood sugar of 65, and um, I try to keep my blood sugar around 83. 
um, I don't worry about the few grams of glucose that I use over the course of the day for uh, correcting the lows. And I don't think you have to worry about them either, but that's your decision. I am switching from Umalog to Novalog. From your experience, which lowers blood sugar more, which acts faster? Well, if you had read my book, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, you would know this. Um, Umalog appears to be faster than Novalog and um, also more potent. Now, there's some evidence that I see, but has not been published, that maybe Umalog is no longer twice as powerful as regular insulin as it was when it first came out. Maybe the manufacturer has done something to dilute it and make it less potent. And I do find that Umalog may last eight to 10 hours. Starts off relatively fast, but continues working for quite a while. And ditto for Novolog. So um, this is uh, something that you can evaluate yourself by trial and error. Um, I'd like to know if one of your patients have ever tried prednanolone and or DHEA supplement in order to lower insulin resistance and adrenal fatigue. Well, adrenal fatigue appears to be a myth that's, perpetu that's perpetuated by some of the snake oil salesmen on the internet. Uh, people that uh, are selling special diets or special herbal supplements uh, or other undisclosed chemicals that will protect you from this mythical uh, ailment called adrenal fatigue. Um, frequently, they'll uh, give you a list of diseases that are cured by their, by their supplement. For example, you'll see adrenal fatigue, prostate cancer, uh, poor memory, uh, breast cancer, all cured by some substance that some snake oil salesman on the internet is selling. Um, I've used DHEA sometimes in the treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it's been so rare that I've used it that I cannot recall whether it's been effective or not. I have recently read many articles from type ones asserting that ozempic or trulicity has helped them with their control. Is that a good idea? Is it better than, is one better than the other? Is it okay to take it if I feel already have slow digestion? Well, um, both of these substances are GLP-1 agonists. They're substances that uh, they're similar to substances I've used in the past to um, control overeating. And they were of marginal value and had a problem in that after a while, people would become tolerant of them. And I've totally switched from GLP-1 agonists to substance to Monjaro, which is a mixture of several uh, hormones to, uh, together and appears to be much more effective.
I read your book and it has helped me to lower my A1C from 9.9 .9 to 5.2. My question, why are my glucose levels so much easier to control when I take pain medication, uh, Darvoset? Well, all that I could think of is the fact that Darvoset um, slows digestion. And um, it could well be that uh, it's easier to control your blood sugars when your food is being slowly digested instead of more rapidly. I can't think of any other reason. Darvaset, by the way, uh, per uh, Percocet is uh, uh, a potentially hit addicting painkiller. I have severe burning sensations in the feet, which radiates up to the thighs for, thighs for over 10 years. Hemoglobin A1C has been 4.7 to 5.4 during this period. So diabetes related neuropathy has been uh, discounted. I've been examined by a United Kingdom doctor and full blood panel showing no vitamin deficiencies and normal thyroid levels have been found. Do you have any ideas on what can be causing the pain? Well, I can sort of think at random uh, of excessive doses of vitamin B6 or B B12 can cause neuropathies. Um, impaired circulation can possibly cause uh, neuropathy. Um, if you had some kind of systemic infection, that's another possibility. One potential problem is the thyroid tests um, most physicians do not test for free T3, which is the major active thyroid hormone. They usually uh, test for TSH, which does not relate directly uh, to um, symptoms of hypothyroidism. So you might want to get your free T3 tested. I've been a type 1 diabetic for five years and in the honeymoon phase, after reading your book, I got regular insulin to cover my meals. However, I am struggling to match the curves. I will eat a meal in the morning containing two pounds of meat. Oh boy. Uh, about 30 minutes after an are insulin injection. Mainly I use six units of R, which would give me hypoglycemia. I then dropped to four units and did not get hypoglycemia, but then does not seem to cover my uh, protein since my sugar rose to almost 130 five hours after the meal. Well, this is a lot of meat to eat at one time. And I would imagine that if you eat two pounds of meat today and you eat two pounds of meat tomorrow, the timing of the digestion of that amount of meat is going to vary. And you're going to get variable absorption at least over time, and non-predictability. So uh, I don't know how big you are that you can consume so much meat, whether you're only eating one meal a day or whether you're having three, uh, I have no idea. Um, but I suspect 
that this big a load of protein at one time is causing unpredictability. I've been a type one for last 30 years. For the last two years, I've been battling many issues about my diabetes and I've been getting laser treatment for my retinopathy. I have it in both eyes. After treatment of my left eye, Vision has been badly affected, and I lost 70% of my vision. Throughout last years, my A1C have been 6.5 to 7, and for the last year, 5.4. Reading your book and having a low-carb diet helped me tremendously to keep my sugar level as correct as possible. But I am battling many complications right now, and I need some guide, guidance, and quite honestly, my life has been all hell. Well, I guess that this person is uh, depressed over his diabetic complications, and I can, I only could free associate to two things. One, that he might want to join type one grit on the internet and converse with other people or families with diabetes and um, see if uh, they can give him some advice. But also, it helps your state of mind to help other people. So maybe with your long experience with diabetes, 30 years, you might be able to give advice to others and maybe that's maybe spending your time in that way can help to make you feel uh, more comfortable. I'm using both the Libre 2 and One Touch Vario Flex, Vario Dex, Flex. Between 4 and 6 a.m., they do not match. I get numbers from the Libre Less than eighty, less than seventy-three, and the vario between fifty-three and sixty-eight. Which do I believe? Well, in my experience, at normal blood sugars, the freestyle freedom and the freedom light have been the most accurate. So the two meters that you're uh, using are not ones that I would be using. Um, I, can, I have never compared the, these two meters with one another, but um, I recommend the Freestyle Freedom and the Freedom Light. I'm 52 year old female from Australia who has had type one diabetes nearly 50 years, well controlled with last A1C equal to 6%. Well, 6% is about 140, which is not terrible, but it is um, above normal. I haven't had any major issues until I recently got advised I had an extremely right heart calcium scar and blockages following an angiogram. My question is, having, is having a bypass a safer solution than stents for long-term type 1s facing treatment for blockages? Well, again, from what I've been reading, um, these kind of major interventions, which in and of themselves can have adverse complications, are reserved for people who have angina, that is pain in their chest, 
and there are guidelines for how rapidly after an angina attack and possibly a heart attack um, you should have uh, either a stent or a bypass. So uh, I don't believe that a routine bypasses and stents are being used for uh, high calcium stores. I think that um, you have to cons uh, contact your cardiologist and see what they recommend. Certainly in the USA, I don't believe that they're recommending uh, this kind of intervention uh, based upon a calcium score rather than a heart attack or angina, angina which is chest pain. I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the end of June 2022 with an A1C of 13.2 percent. Wow, very high. I was grossly overweight at 310 pounds. I went very low carb and then zero carb carnivore for three or four months and then a very small amount of vegetables afterwards. Within six months, my A1C was down to 5.5. Wow. I have heard from other doctors online that some point that at some point it is a good idea to reintroduce some high level of carbs back into our diet. I'm guessing that is between 50 and 150 grams per day. Is this advisable and why? Well, I know what I would do for me. I would uh, not exclude carbohydrates. I would try to have low carb vegetables and maybe uh, a total of 20 or 30 grams of carb maximum in a day, but that's for me. Um, the guidelines that doctors are recommending are still based upon the cholesterol myth, which was created, I guess, in the 1950s uh, and 60s and maintained that cardiac disease and strokes were caused by high fat and that carbohydrate had nothing to do with it and high blood sugars had nothing to do with it and this was partially dispelled by the DCCT trials on diabetics but um, uh, many physicians are still following the so-called cholesterol myth and um, trying to get you to avoid uh, fats, especially fats associated with protein. I follow your regimen, which is some, wait, okay, I follow your regimen, which is same meal and injecting same dose of insulin day after day, but the problem comes in basal insulin. Are there some time periods when I don't need basal insulin from 12 to 3 p.m. and from 6 to 10 p.m.? And if I inject Traceba, my blood sugar would go too low during these time periods. So instead, I inject Eumulin N five times a day, which works for four hours. Please guide me and let me know what do your other patients experience? Uh, do you have other patients experiencing the same problems? Um, I've had a few patients that find that when they take Traceba insulin, their blood sugars, when they take it twice a day, their blood sugars may go low at certain times of the day. And if it's consistent, 
day after day, I have them take a protein, small protein snack uh, before the time that they expect the lows. And uh, if they have the same amount of the snack day after day, they seem to be preventing the lows. Uh, that's uh, another option uh, would be to take uh, a small number of macadamia nuts uh, at the same time of day, the same number of nuts, and see if that works. I am a type 3C diabetic and have been for a few years. Now, a type 3C diabetic is someone who's had part of his pancreas removed or destroyed by pancreatitis or an infection uh, or possibly a um, non-metastatic uh, malignancy um, may be removed surgically. Sometimes it's uh, the tail of the pancreas, sometimes the head of the pancreas. Usually, uh, if they have part of the pancreas removed, not only do they make less insulin, but they uh, may be making less of digestive enzymes that the pancreas secretes. So, I rarely go low, but when I am not eating as well as I should, I often require a lot of insulin. I've been doing a carnivore diet, beef, bacon, eggs, and butter, for almost six months, and I have taken precisely zero insulin since. Why? Well, first of all, this person doesn't disclose what his blood sugars are. So it could be that he uh, is not taking insulin and has high blood sugars. Um, it could also be that his blood sugars are not elevated, but because of the uh, partial diabetic state, he's lost phase one insulin response. And because he's eating foods that very slowly raise blood sugar, he's able to keep up with uh, the demands on his pancreas with phase two insulin response, as I explain in my book. So, um, it could well be that because he's making fewer pancreatic digestive enzymes, he's digesting these uh, bacon, eggs, and butter very slowly and can keep up with them uh, with a little bit of insulin that he makes. Or she, I keep saying she, he, but it could be she too for all these questions. My son has been having nighttime lows occasionally, more so with school being out and more exercise. His endocrinologist is persist persistent that his basal needs be dropped lower to correct nighttime lows. We lowered his, and now he wakes up high with a BG of 162 to 200. His A1C level was 8.5. in February, now it's 7.2. What options do we have to stay in the 70 to 130 BG range day and night? Well, first of all, I'd suggest that you read my book and you might try using Traceba insulin twice daily. Uh, in small doses. 
uh, it's all trial and error. Uh, and I, not having more details, I can't give you any more information. Sorry. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time. And good luck. Have a good year. So long.